So welcome everyone. My name is Joe Brewer and I'm here with my co-presenter, Susan Bozak, and um, we'll each introduce ourselves very quickly. Um, and then we wanna get into the, the richness of the topic today, which is how to regenerate your bioregion. And the reason that I invited Susan to come is because Susan, uh, well, basically Susan's team, the, the Legacy Project in the greater Takaranto bioregion in Southern Ontario, um, has been in a deep collaboration with us in BardHR Columbia for about two years to co-create the learning exchanges that are helping us to each regenerate our own bioregions while also supporting exchanges between them. And this goes to many other bioregions in the, in the world through the work that my other partner, Penny Hypo, who's here on the call, you can see with those cool pink glasses. Um, Penny and I are the co-founders of the Design School for Regenerating Earth, where we hold the learning exchanges between bioregions to be able to live out a design process that can move toward regeneration at the scale of continents and the scale of the planet as a whole. So we really work with a lot of bioregions around the world, but we have a very special relationship between the greater Takaranto, which is Takaranto is the indigenous name of the Toronto area, and the, and the Northern Andes here in Colombia. And so for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm originally from the Ozarks bioregion in Missouri in the United States. And um, I have been doing work with large scale systemic change for decades. And I'm very passionate about how do we regenerate the entire planet? I won't say anything more about myself for now. And then I'll invite Susan to introduce herself. And before Susan introduces herself, just so you know, our agenda is that Susan will introduce herself. We'll give a short presentation to introduce our bioregions. And then we'll share how we are practicing being sister bioregions. So we'll have a dialogue between the two of us about that exchange. And then we'll open it up for a conversation for the rest of the time. So that's the basic structure because we only have an hour. So um, I'd love to pass it over to Susan. Thank you, Joe. My name is Susan Bosak, and um, I'm here in, as Joe said, the Greater Tuckeronto Bioregion, which is in Canada. Um, my background is in education and the social sciences. I've done a lot of systems complexity work, and I founded the Legacy Project, which I think is the legacy project of my lifetime, but also of all of our lifetimes at this moment in history. And together with my partners in time, Brian and Douglas, we are the core team working um, in the bioregion here and connecting the things that we do locally to into the global context. Because as Joe is fond of saying, no bioregion is an island, not even the islands. And unless we're all working in our areas but are connected to everywhere else, then we're not going to get to entire to regenerating the entire planet. So, so did you want to do the slides now, Joe? Yeah, I will in just a moment. And uh, I just dropped two links into the chat, uh, one for bioregional earth. So if you want to follow the story of bioregions organizing themselves across the planet, go to bioregional earth. And then I gave a link to the Design School for Regenerating Earth. Susan, if you'd like to grab the, the link for the legacy project so people can have that as well, then you'll have an easy time finding us. Mm -hmm. um, so what I wanna do now is uh, just basically set a very brief bit of context and then we'll go into the slide deck. So we're gonna be talking about bioregions. And for those who don't know what a bioregion is, I love the way that Peter Berg describes it when he uses the phrase life place. It is the place in which all life occurs. So all aspects of life that are needed for a living system has a geographic range. And so for humans, there's a geographic range for the kind of geology, ecology, and culture that enable us to holistically live in a place. And that geographic range is what you would call the bioregion. And so you'll get a flavor of that in a moment because Susan and I will both introduce the bioregions that we're living and working in. But I just wanted to very briefly give you that definition. And now what I want to do is go into the slides where Susan will speak first, I'll, see, I'll speak second, and then we'll start a conversation between the two of us, and then we'll invite you to join us. That's going to be the, it's going to be, think of it like rivers that will create a confluence of two and then a confluence of all of us to flow together. So let's go ahead and do that. Here are the slides, and I will then 
pass it over to, um, oops, let me actually do this because of the way Zoom works. There we go. And now, uh, Susan, over to you. Great. This is the Great Lakes Basin in the northern part of Turtle Island. And the Great Lakes Basin has 21% of the world's fresh surface water. These are five large lakes, hundreds of rivers, streams, watersheds. We have an amazing amount of water here. And what's really cool is and Joe had mentioned this the other day, is looking at these lakes, you would think they are separate, but they are all connected. Lake Superior up at the top there flows down and connects through all the other lakes and ends up in Lake Ontario, which then flows into the St. Lawrence River and out to the Atlantic Ocean. So it's interesting, our bioregion is the dark green right on Lake Ontario. And when you think about it, everything that happens in the Great Lakes flows into and eventually ends up in the greater Tuckeronto bioregion, that dark mass that you see over Lake Ontario. So we're on the north shore of Lake Ontario. We also, also touch Lake Erie and Lake Huron. So the next slide shows the fuzzy boundary of the GTB, Greater Tuckeronto Bioregion. And as Joe mentioned, Tuckeronto is a indigenous word. It means where the trees meet the water. And if you talk to indigenous elders before colonial settlement, there was an amazing rich food forest here, multi-layered food forest, because of course this area had all this water and that food forest of course was cut down by the settlers and required a lot of regeneration to get it back to where it is now, which is kind of in a questionable state because we have a lot of monoculture. But we have a, a fuzzy boundary on the GTB. That means it's not firm. Sometimes we expand it out a bit because we need to include something. Sometimes we pull it back a bit. It's 3 million hectares, 10 million people, which is a quarter of Canada's population, and it includes uh, the largest city in Canada, which is Toronto, and you can see kind of the brown clumping toward the middle of the bioregion. And the bioregion was first outlined by David Crombie, who was a former Toronto mayor and federal cabinet, cabinet minister in a 1992 report called Regeneration. That was 30 years ago. And he was thinking about the idea of a bioregion. And he said, this, is, this approach is both a way of doing things and a way of thinking. It's not a new concept. Indigenous peoples have long understood their connectedness to the ecosystem, the land, water, air, and other life. Thinking about the whole bioregion helps focus attention on the interdependencies. And David Crombie, we've had the pleasure of meeting him. He's in his 80s now. And one of his favorite things to say is everything is connected to everything else, which I think people in this room really understand. Um, the next map shows two of the key features in the bioregion. So bioregion, as Joe basically touched on, is your life place. It's defined by geology, ecology, and culture, including indigenous history. So two of the geological features that define the bioregion here is on the left side there, on the west, the Niagara Escarpment. This is UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. It stretches over 725 kilometers, and it has elevations ranging, you know, from 430 meters to less with um, Great Lakes coastline and cliff edges and wet, wetlands and woodlands. Lots of species of birds, mammals, fish, cedar trees that are over a thousand years old. So it's a really rich, cool area. The other unique feature of the GTB is the Oak Ridges Moraine, which you can see sort of in the center with rivers flowing south and north from the moraine. And we call this the heart of the GTB because it pumps the life-giving water. Um, it's a unique formation of sand and gravel deposits, captures rain, filters it, and then like a sponge, dissipates it through the bioregion. So once again, we have an abundance of riches here in terms of water. 
So in terms of all the water and geological features, there are some cultural features that make the GTB unique. And on this next page, you can see um, Toronto, first of all, has the largest green belt in the world, 800,000 hectares of protected land. And we're also, cleverly, already organized by watersheds. So that's one of the defining characteristics when you're trying to decide a bioregion is where are the watersheds. So these conservation authorities are local watershed management agencies, and there are 13 conservation authorities already organized by watershed. So that gives this area as a bioregion a lot of things to work with in terms of understanding our place and, our, and the life in this place. So when we talk to people about this work, I could go in with charts and diagrams and graphs, but we go in with a piece of art and we tell people that what we are doing is growing a tree of life. So we talk about at the bottom left there, hashtag change the story. The big story that we live by, this is like the overstory of what we value and what we don't in this civilization. Um, the, all of the work is rooted in Indigenous worldviews and knowledge, and you see that at the, back, at the bottom of the art piece. The tree trunk centers the bioregion. So everything we do flows into this story of the bioregion, this place of the bioregion, and then fractally scales up into the Great Lakes, into the planet. We do, do to the left and right of the tree trunk social regeneration, so generations in community. We use this intergenerational dynamic. And on the other side, ecological regeneration, bio region, community and bioregion. So we use generations and the place to try and support change. You can see all the themes that we're working with in the crown of the tree. And the ultimate goal is that bright star, our sun up in the upper right corner, which is eco psychosocial well-being. I can't be okay unless we're okay. We can't be okay unless all the living things around us are okay. Otherwise, we have nothing to sustain us. So we talk about the bioregion as the smallest unit of well-being. And I just wanted to end with one of my favorite pictures. And you'll recognize the, uh, this fellow in the picture. This is Joe. And everything you need to know, I think, about reimagining education is in this photo. This was taken about three weeks ago when Joe and Penny were here in the GTB visiting the bioregion. And you see this intergenerational dynamic. Those kids are like, four years old, five years old, and Joe's working with them. You see the north-south dynamic. These are kids in Canada, Canadian westernized kids. And they're talking to this guy with long hair from Colombia, and they're trying to figure him out. And they got on wonderfully. And they're on the land, they're touching life. I think they're exploring earthworms there. I think they're touching earthworms. They're stewarding life. We did a riparian planting. So the kids were there helping out. It was a real world experience and it was beautifully emergent in a moment that contained all moments across generations and on the land. So that to me is reimagining education. Mm, thank you, Susan. And I'll just add that, uh, as my partner Penny would say, uh, really, if I could just, like, if we weren't in planetary collapse and dealing with very serious, complex planetary issues, I would just be playing with kids all day. I just come alive when I'm around little kids because I'm just a taller little kid. Um, what I want to do now is shift and briefly share with you where Penny, my partner Penny Hypel and I live and where we do our work, which is in Barichara, Colombia. And Barichara, as you can see on this map, is in the heart of the Northern Andes. It's in a place where the Northern Andes divide into three separate mountain ridges. And the work that we're doing in Barichara is in a very well-defined regional climate system, which is that there are uh, very tall mountains to our west. You can see here, it actually points at the town of Barichara. There are very tall mountains to our west, very tall mountains to our northeast and very tall mountains to our southwest, 
or southeast. And the only way that air can enter into our area bringing water is from the southwest. That the air that's coming directly west goes up over the mountains, drops all of its water as rain into a cloud forest, and then the dry air falls into the valley where Bodhichara is. And the air that brings moisture has to come in from the southwest and make a large spiral to create the kind of unique ecosystems that exist within this blue zone. Unfortunately, this entire region is in the process of becoming a desert and we need to turn it around. And you can see why that is in this picture here. So this is the plateau that the town of Bodhichara is on. Right there is Bodhichara, so you can see where it's located. I just want you to notice how much is yellow and red and brown, how much is not green? Because this is a place with a unique ecosystem called the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest. It exists nowhere else on Earth. Eight out of 10 species are endemic. They exist only here. And this forest is 95% deforested. About 80 years ago, to grow monoculture crops, they cut down the entire forest, and, and now the entire region is in the process of becoming a desert. So what we're doing in Bodhichara is creating a prototype for a regenerative economy at the bioregional scale. And the way that we're doing this is that we have created a framework that we call the Bioregional Regeneration Platform, which is that in order to regenerate this land, we need to create a different kind of learning ecosystem. So we have to have education across the entire territory working in a different way. We need to create a tapestry of local projects doing regenerative work that are increasingly collaborating with each other. And then we need to have funding and governance for how we flow resources to those local projects that can organize to the scale of the entire landscape and to the entire bioregion. And what's beautiful about this bioregional regeneration platform is that as we started developing this, Susan and her team in the greater Takaranto bioregion began organizing their thinking in the same way. Basically, we were doing similar things before, but this platform gave us a way of, of very specifically working together. How can the people of the greater Takaranto bioregion mobilize money to support education in Bodhichara to then be able to show what we're doing in Bodhichara to inspire change in the greater Takaranto bioregion. And it's that way of organizing exchange that we want to start to talk with you about now, which is that Susan and her team, which includes uh, her, part, her, her husband, Brian, and, uh, and other members of their team, and a large network of collaborators across the greater Takaranto area. The work that we're doing in Bodhichara involves local schools, it involves reforestation, it involves local government, it involves watershed restoration, local economic development. Basically, we're doing all of it. We're prototyping a different way of living organized at the landscape scale. But for us to do this, we have to mobilize international partnerships for bringing in funding and for bringing in learning. And we travel to other places to share what we're doing in Bodhichara to catalyze change in other places. And so the, the idea that we want to introduce right now as part of our conversation, which actually a member of the Ecoversities Alliance, Kayala Young, uh, has talked for years about sister bioregions. Well, we see ourselves as sister bioregions. What that means is we want to create a family of different bioregions with complementary uh, things to learn. So as Susan said, the greater Takaranto bioregion has the most abundant fresh water on earth. The Great Lakes holds more water than all 200 rivers of the Amazon basin. Where we are in Bodhichara, all of our rivers are dead. Either they're completely dry, except for a few hours after the rain, or they're so polluted that there's no fish that live in them and you can't drink in them. Children cannot swim in them. So we're a place becoming a desert with extreme scarcity of water. And they're in a place where climate change is causing massive flooding. 
Their problem is too much water. But there are things that we share. We need to have intergenerational relationships. We need to focus on the children. We need different kinds of education, different models for economics, different ways of collaborating. And we're bu building exchanges in those places. So what I'd love to do is just invite Susan to share a little bit of her experience, like what is, what is being changed and how is Toronto benefiting from working with Bodhichara? And then what I will do is respond by sharing how Bodhichara is benefiting from what's happening in the greater Takaranto. And then we'll open it up into a conversation with all of us. So Susan, I'd love to pass it to you to share some of the ways that you're learning and benefiting from partnering with us in Bodhichara. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting when you talk about water because people here take water for granted. And one of the interesting things in sharing your experiences in Barichara is the dead rivers, the idea of dead rivers. And that brings it home for people when you tell those stories, when they see the photos that you share. I think it brings it home for people how different it is in other parts of the world and how lucky we are and what a responsibility it is here to have all this water. So I think that that's been a very stark point of learning. The other thing is the difference in the cultures. I don't know how we can reimagine education when particularly in a Western culture, we're in it every day. We're in the mass advertising, we're in the political advertising. We are in the suburbs, we're in the big city with the towering you know, skyscrapers. When you are living in that story, I don't know how to get out of that story other than looking at someplace different than yourself like Barichara. In Barichara there, I mean, it's a, 7,000 people, I think the population is, where we've got 10 million here. So it's a much smaller scale. And also the sense of community. One of the things that surprised people when we started sharing stories is that you would have two, three, five hour meetings, gatherings of people, and that they would be intergenerational. There would be mothers nursing babies. There would be toddlers running around. And none of that happens here. I can barely get someone on a half hour Zoom and get enough of their attention. So there's the, the cultural differences that we've been able to, to talk to people about. And the fact that unless we start in building relationships, we can't make the changes that need to be made because we remain in a, in a, in a very isolated individualistic mindset. You're muted. I want to start to compliment this by first naming that one of the most beautiful things about Colombia is its people. Anyone who's been to Colombia, the people are so warm. Everyone kisses and hugs when they see each other. It's just so much love and affection. And even more because of the history of violence. So Colombia had terrible violence in the last century where Colombian people killed Colombian people. And what the outcome of that is, is that the Colombian people are some of the best peace builders on earth. They're just so good at building peace. And there are about 80 intact indigenous cultures. Most of them are still on their ancestral lands. And so the, the depth of culture here is amazing. And there's really nothing like it in North America, even though the Great Lakes and I would say Cascadia are the two places in North America where the indigenous people still have access to their ancestral lands. So there's much, much more of that connection. But South America is just, you have plant medicine and deep ceremony. There's just so much here. But one thing that we don't have is we don't have a lot of money. We don't have a culture of philanthropy. So here where I live in Colombia, there's a thing called Minga, which would translate roughly like uh, a barn raising in North America you know, where the neighbors come together and do something. Um, but they also, uh, instead of crowdfunding, they say, um, 
um, I say, I'll say emociona vaca, we make a cow, <laughs> which is to say that basically we pull together what we need to make something happen. But what's interesting is the cultural practices that are these collaborative economic models directly come from the indigenous cultures. It's like the potlatch or the potluck, which is from the indigenous people of Northwestern North America. This, this kind of culture is very present here. And so what, one of the things that we've learned and gained from our time partnering with the greater Takaranto bioregion is that Brian and Susan were able to get a large provincial grant from the Ontario government. You could ask how difficult that was and how painful it is to get one of those grants. But that meant that they had budget to do things like organize a conference and pay for a media team. So that when we would go there and participate in a conference, they could produce very good media content. They can have professionally produced videos of the talks where we are presenting these ideas. And this has helped us to build our presence and to elevate the quality of our stories for the work that we're doing in Latin America, to connect between North America and South America. And this is a really, really important thing. Another thing that's been really powerful for us is that there are schools in uh, North America not only in Toronto, but also in Colorado and in Washington State near Seattle and in other places where we're building relationships between teachers there and the Waldorf School that we're creating here in Barichara. And a lot of our success at raising funding to pay the teachers for the alternative school in Barichara has come through relationships with teachers in North America. So this um, Eagle and Condor relationship Aguile y Condor, this relationship between North and South America, has been how most of the financial flow and the learning exchanges have occurred. So living into that story has been profound. And then also, the Legacy Project has a wonderful relationship with Dr. Dan Longboat, and then by extension, several indigenous leaders from the Great Lakes, so that we can create active learning exchanges about how does indigenous knowledge come into the process of creating a bioregional learning center, something that we're doing here in Barichara, where the indigenous people of Barichara were mostly destroyed. I would say the, the um, genocide was mostly successful. The Guane people of our region, um, their culture and their language were almost entirely destroyed, but they are part of a larger federation called Muisca, and they're part of a larger language family called Chibcha, and the Chibcha language family includes the Kogi and Tirona and Arhuaco to the north, as well as many other cultures throughout the Northern Andes, which means we're able to restore some of the cultural connections to indigenous people, but we have to do it indirectly through neighboring tribes. Whereas when you go to Toronto, you've got the Mohawk, the Seneca, the Oneida, the Onondaga, and more, and they're all still right there. And so our ability to collaborate inter, um, between the North and South American indigenous cultures is a huge, huge process of decolonization that helps us to do our work in South America while also catalyzing it in North America. So these are some of the kinds of exchange that we're able to achieve. And we've only been doing it for two years so far. <laughs> um, but I wonder, Susan, is there anything else you'd like to say before we open it up? to everyone else who's participating. And before Susan goes, if anyone has a question or a comment, please raise your hand and we can start to form a queue of a line of, of responses. And then we can take your questions and comments in order. So please use the hand raising queue and we can start to invite you after Susan shares. So Susan, over to you. Yeah, the indigenous piece is so important. And I know that we've talked about it in, in a lot of detail. I really admire what you're doing, you're able to do in the uh, school that you've created and bringing in Indigenous voices. And I know that you're planning to bring that in more so that that becomes a basis for the education the kids are receiving. And on the Tree of Life diagram, all of the work here is rooted in Indigenous knowledge, people of this place. And one of the prophecies that lo the local Indigenous peoples talk about is that we're at a point where we have to make a choice between two paths, the charred path where we continue to destroy life, or the green path where we choose the continuation of life. 
And then they point out, it's not as simple as just coming to a fork in the road and choosing the green path that before we can go on that green path, we have to go back on the path we've just come and pick up all the knowledge that's been discarded, forgotten, ignored, um, erased, because we need to refine and relearn all of those things that have been lost before we can move forward in integrity and with what Indigenous people here call two-eyed seeing, that we can use the best of Western science and all that can bring to regeneration here, but that we also recognize that Indigenous ways of knowing and understanding the world are very holistic and use a part of our brain that in Western culture, we have really underutilized and marginalized. So this is a really important point to how both we're organizing and relearning here. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. And I just wondering if there are any questions or comments, uh, we can actually open this up into a, a conversation now. Um, if there are any questions that are coming up about what either Susan has said or what I have said, or if you'd like to bring us in a new direction, we have about 25 minutes, so we have plenty of time for a nice conversation. I'm just curious if there's anyone who has a question or a comment you'd like to add. Yes, Julian. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, from Colombia. I'm nowadays in Cali, in the COP16. So I'm just, I have a, um, Sort of a hint to to tell you, but uh, do you know that Barichara and Santander, all that region, uh, um, has a uh, sandy soils. So it means doesn't matter what you do on the surface, water will always infiltrate down the aquifers. So it is not. I don't know if it's becoming a desert, but it was it it's been always like that. I don't know if it's if it's getting worse. If it's get it, it's getting worse, let me tell you this because of a lot of gentrification, you know, a lot of people who are not locals are going there because we, you, you know, and I know, because I've been there, this is the most beautiful town in Colombia. So yeah, a lot of people with money from Medellin, from Bogota, from Cali, and from abroad, from Canada, from US, USA, they just go and buy a house and then put it on Airbnb. And then it, and then it becomes like, a, you know, like a, like a tourist hotspot. And you know what, what, what it brings people just um, looking for a, a jacuzzi, just, you know, for, for, for one hour and then the other day another jacuzzi, whatever. So I think at the end, uh, I don't know, uh, systemically, what would be better? Just to leave, this, leave us alone, <laughs> we will recover ourselves or really just try to bring more um, outside ideas to, to yeah, to, to, yeah. Yeah, that's my point. Yeah. Thank you, Julian. The uh, gentrification and the price of land here that's actually abandoned farmland is more expensive than uh, land would be at the edge of Paris in France. It's extremely expensive. Um, but you're absolutely incorrect about the soils. It's no sandy soils at all. It's clay, which is why there are really good uh, groundwater supplies here. But once you remove the vegetative cover, there are two things that happen. One is that clay becomes hard when it's exposed to the sun and becomes like concrete, which means when it, when it rains, the water just runs away. And as the water starts to run, it carves ditches, pulling away whatever remains of the soil, accelerating erosion on these steep slopes, which is what's been happening since the forest was removed. So this is a place where when it rains, almost no water goes into the aquifers because it all runs off into the river, into Rio Suarez within two or three hours after the rain event, and it increases the erosion and removes what remains of the soils as it's doing it. And so that's a, a very big issue for the type of soil that's here. But the beautiful thing is that all of that can be reversed by reintroducing vegetative cover, by basically reforestation, combined with, uh, with dry land um, ecology techniques for watershed restoration, stacking rocks and stream beds to slow the water to help it to sink and, and various other things. Um, another thing that's happening in Barichara that's really a big issue is that it is true that wealthy people are coming here and buying land and building houses and hotels. And in the last year, it was especially bad that the local people had no water 
And actually the bomberos, the local firefighters, had to bring a truck and deliver water to all of the campesinos on a daily or weekly basis for months on end. While there are about 100 hotels in this little town, all of which have swimming pools, and there are about 150 houses in the town that the richest people in Colombia come to to sit in their jacuzzis and swimming pools while the local people don't have water. So one of the issues that's really, really important is to restore the sovereignty of local people to collaborate at the scale of watersheds to start to, to change the direction of that trajectory. There's something that's happening with community aqueducts, with organizing around um, agroforestry projects that can create different economic models for local people to remain here and a lot more to be said. But I just wanted to name that um, the reason that the place is becoming a desert is because the forest was lost. Steep slopes together with mud and clay is the perfect recipe for a rapid erosion. And that the displacement of local people is being driven, driven by the lack of alternatives to that tourism economy together with extreme speculation, meaning the land is so valuable to sell financially that people are selling it and moving away, which is displacing local people very quickly. Uh, but that was actually driven by Colombians well before the outsiders came. And what's interesting is there are more outsiders coming who have a regenerative mindset that at least are helping to slow down that pattern. But it's a predicament and not a problem, which means it's a very, very challenging dynamic that requires deep cultural change and a lot of collaboration. Um, but just, just naming some of those elements to, to share some more of the complexity of this context. Of course, there's a lot more to say than what I just did. But I saw that, um, is it Yuda? Uh, how do you pronounce your name? Uh, I'd love to hear from you and welcome. Thank you. Um, and and uh, you answered, I think you answered my original question because I just um, got back from, I'm in Denver, Colorado now. Um, I just got back from like my first, like really intentional trip um, to New Mexico. And when you were talking about the clay, which I think is pretty much what their land is like, um, I was just thinking that maybe you guys have a similar problem, like, but their problem is the decimation of the beaver and the buffalo population. And it sounds like your problem is deforestation. So they're not really the same. Um, but I left my hand up um, because you talked about getting the power back into the hands of the people. And I'm just wondering, do you have any real ideas about how to do that? Mm. Oh, I, I will even say that if Penny, my partner Penny, who's here, would like to share, um, I'll just talk a little bit about what we're doing with a, a nonprofit we're setting up called Tierra Sagrada. And its purpose is to bring land into the commons. And um, the key dynamic that we're focusing on is reciprocity relationships. How do we create reciprocity between people who donate money into the community and what's happening in the local community? How do we create reciprocity between land stewards and their neighbors? And also the organization that might bring money or other kinds of support to them. And how do we create reciprocity between regenerative projects and the rest of the community? So just as an example of a kind of reciprocity relationship, there's a local family that we know and a man named Arturo. He has 13 hectares of land and he doesn't have very much money and he keeps selling more and more of his land to pay expenses his family needs to pay. Uh, but he has two daughters and a son. And so pretty soon his children are gonna have no place to live in this territory. So one reciprocity relationship could be that he sells that land at a discounted price to the community organization, but then becomes a member with voting rights. And we create a social agreement that says, you, re you receive less money because you get other benefits. One benefit could be that we set aside part of that land for his children to always have access to to have a house so that they don't get this place so they can live there, but that we bring money to them to start setting up an agroforestry system that might take five years to become economically productive. Okay, so they would establish it, but it wouldn't create financial returns until the nut trees or the fruit trees are mature, something like that. That this kind of reciprocity relationship is uh, a way of creating a transition 
from broken economic models now to much better economic models in the future with um, healthy relationships throughout the entire process. And this allows for local people to enter into agreements and partner with each other to be sure that their needs are being met in those agreements so there's healthy power dynamics between them. And it's not just those who come in with money decide what happens and local people are desperate, which is how it usually works. And so we're trying to undo those kinds of dynamics with very clear ways of creating reciprocity agreements. Um, so Penny, I don't know if you want to add any more on that before I go on to Greg, or, or do you feel content? Thought you might have something more you'd like to share on this one. Oh, and you're muted. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, yeah. So the only thing I would add to that is to say that um, one of the main areas that we're working in is with trauma. Um, and it's a, there's different kinds of trauma at different places in the world. And here it's around the violence that's happened for, for many, many years. Um, and also just trauma around money, trauma around the colonization. So just to add that in, that that's central work to, um, to being able to even create these relationships that that Joe's describing the reciprocal relationships that are needed. So I'm just gonna, that's all I'm gonna add in just briefly. Yeah. If yeah. I could just, if I could just add one thing, Joe. Yes, please. Um, it's interesting because here we do have land trusts, but the mindset of the land trusts is protecting, conserving the land, but not regenerating the land and seeing how we can bring sovereignty back to people in the community. So this is definitely something that we are learning about here in the GTB from the work that you're doing in the in Barichara. Mm, thank you for that, Susan. And then Vanessa. Yeah, and then um, thank you for sharing your, your experience. And, and I have some, some questions um, speaking about regeneration on how do you actually build some relationship with different, let's say, stakeholders and powers. It could be informal, informal or formal powers in the bio region. And I ask this because um, in Mexico, in the Guanajuato area, there was a region, bio region of 12,000 hectares. And, um, and we were working on understanding the land with the people and we understood that it didn't matter. It was not enough if we did a bioeconomy project regenerating the, the soil at the beginning. If we didn't uh, build healthy relationships with the water agency because they they are still like extracting the water because it's like really going to the all, all the urban area. We also understood that um narrow people and these powers needed to to be supporting the project or at least not messing out with what we were doing and and in general um i wonder how how do you do this relationship with, with these other powers and people that really need at least not to be stopping or blocking the activities and what you're saying susan we also experience a lot of um frustration because as you say many of the normative regulations are in these paradigms of conserving and they're conserving you cannot do anything and there are overlaps of different laws like the certification and there's like a natural protected area but in other part of the same by a region it has a different um they say uh use so so it's quite complex so the governance aspect is so important and the few clues I have is doing it through compassion. But, you know, like if I tell you what we've experienced is a lot of chucks. So I wonder how do you do it there? How do you build these relationships? What will be the, the key to make it happen? Susan, would you like to answer that? That's a really big and a really important question. And it's something that we struggle with really every day. One of the things that we're trying to do 
is create parallel structures and processes um, rather than trying to meet the existing structures head on because that can take a lot of time and energy and instead of creating something you're just constantly fighting against something as i said one of the the benefits that we have are the conservation authorities they are already arranged by watershed and their job is to protect the watersheds now their powers are being eroded but this bioregional story has brought new energy to those conservation authorities they are seeing themselves as empowered they are seeing that story as something that they can tell the public and help them help the public relearn what this place is and the value of this place. And then one of the ways that I think we may have some success in dealing with power structures is we are looking at mapping the entire bioregion and what areas are degraded, what areas have water, what areas are zoned for uh, development, what areas aren't, mapping the entire bioregion and recently, all the municipalities, we have over 100 municipalities, municipal governments, have been mandated by the federal government to report on their um, regeneration work. So by doing this map and having everybody in the same story and seeing each other and the bioregion as a whole and having those municipalities required to report on their activities, I think that we're going to start to re-educate, to shift the paradigm. And this is not a short process. This is going to be 50-year work. This is going to be 200-year work. Um, so we have to have a lot of patience, a lot of patience. So I'll just add a quick story because I want to hear from Wangu. But, um, to say that one of the most important relationships that we've been, or maybe I should say, I as a gringo from the North, there's a very important relationship I've been building, which is that there's a, a project in Barichara called Bio Parque Moncora. It's a community forest, it's 15 years old. So it's been going for a lot longer than I've been here. I've been here for five years. And the owner of the Bio Parque is an association, Asociación Aquileopada. It's got 40 members, the 40 members are people who live in the community and they're local community leaders. Most of them are from here. They're not people from Bogota or somewhere else. And, and when I first arrived, they were very distrusting of me because I've now learned a lot of people come to Barichara, they say a lot of things and almost none of them do what they say. So the best way to build trust has been to actually do what I say and to just keep doing it for more than a few months. So people would come and say, I'm going to build this eco blah, blah, blah thing. And then it just becomes a, a luxury hotel. And so people come into Barichara and say one thing and do another. It's very rare for some here, someone to come, say that they're going to do something for the community, and then actually do it and keep doing it for years. So over the span of three or four years, trust started to grow. And right now, we're in a negotiation to purchase a piece of land that will be give, given to the community that protects the Bio Parque forever. And we're buying the land from that same association. And there is such deep trust between us that the purchase of this land is going to transform the distrust. It's going to completely dispel it. It's going to put us in a place of, of partnership and collaboration with mutual respect and mutual power between the local people and the international relationships that we're using to bring the money in. So these are processes that take years. But I just wanted to tell that story briefly to say that the suspicion of outsiders is very well-deserved, but also the trust that is built is very well-deserved if we take the time to build it, but it takes time. And so, um, so I just wanted to name that. And then Wangu, thank you so much for your patience and would love to hear from you. Hi, y'all. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I would love to just ask or invite a bit of a deepening on what Penny began to speak of about trauma and about repairing trust um, in relationships. Um, yeah, because I think we we are coming to understand like 
the trauma that lives in our bodies, like the land is also, the territory is also a body and that trauma also lives in the land. And what is that repairing of trust that we do between humans or amongst humans and then also between humans and the more than human and the land and the territory? Yeah, I'd love to hear some more reflections on that and what you've been practicing yourselves. Penny, would you like to answer that one? Yeah, so I would say in, in Bodhichara, there's already, there's connection to indigenous wisdom here and a lot of indigenous ceremony and traditions that they use here for, for working with trauma. And also the people here are, are also learning some of the techniques that are coming out of the, the North. So uh, the body-based trauma work is the work that I've studied and practiced um, in the North in the United States. And some of that is even making its way here. So it's a combination of, of that kind of work, working somatically with the body uh, to transform the trauma, and then some of the indigenous traditions that are already here. And um, Joe, I don't know if you want to say more about for a soma and and that kind of work, the healing work with the women's circles and and so forth. Yeah, I'll just say that um, Bodhichara, the name Bodhichara means a place of rest. It was a ceremonial site of the Guane people and a gathering place of indigenous people all over the Northern Andes for thousands of years, at least 8,000 years, probably longer. And so this is a place with a lot of healing practices and the land itself slows you down to a deep rhythm and deep land connection because this place is just so much power. And so, um, so there are a lot of healers here. So maybe that's all I'll say for now is that there are a lot of healers and a lot of practices that are already here. Um, and because I wanna make time for Greg to share um, before we come to close in a few minutes. Um, but what a beautiful question and a very important topic. So Greg, over to you. Yeah, I was just curious, you talked about the uh, tourist economy as um, yeah, maybe using the term enemy is a little too strong, but as, as one of the things that needs to be um, balanced out by other approaches. And I'm wondering if you have names or models that can describe what the good alternatives to a tourist economy look like. It's so one of the key um, reframing that I think is important for tourism is to recognize that a lot of tourism is already educational. You know, like if I go to Rome and try the wonderful pasta that they make in Italy, I'm actually learning about the culture and the food. So recognizing that education is already a part of a lot of tourism. So one of the key ways to reframe uh, extractive tourism is start to build models of learning exchange around regenerative education. And this doesn't address everything, but it does start to really shift the story. So I'll just give an example. Um, Colombia has been known for a long time for basically two things. Initially it was a gold, and then by extension, everything that colonizers could steal through rape and pillage and conquest. So for 500 years, Colombia has been a place for the Spanish to come and steal all the gold and then for everyone else to keep doing it. And if you look at what's happening with mining companies right now and the pillaging of landscapes, it's, that story is still there. The other story that Colombia has is the story of narco trafficking and cocaine. Now, here's what's interesting. Colombia actually has a third story, but it's not the tourism story. The third story is this is where conservation biology was invented. This is where Alexander von Humboldt came 300 years ago and invented biogeography and set up the research centers for conservation biology in Europe to learn from the plants and animals of Colombia. And if you know the story of Wade Davis in the book, The River, that ethnobotany, the field of ethnobotany was created by studying plant medicines primarily in Colombia, but then extending into Ecuador and other surrounding regions. Basically, it was the Northern Andes and the Amazonian headwaters, which were very important regions for learning ethnobotany. So when you start to see there is a multiple century, at least 300 year story of people coming to Colombia 
to learn from the culture and the ecology of this place. And so this, this reveals something powerful, which is that if Columbia can project a collective story of regenerative education, to say anyone who wants to learn about how to do peace building, how to work with plant medicine, how to restore damaged ecosystems, and then from there you could keep extending, that right now a lot of people think that place is Costa Rica because Costa Rica has done really good marketing as the greenest economy on earth. I say that in quotes because Costa Rica is mostly um, an economic bunker for billionaires because the price of it is so high. Costa Rica was literally the first banana republic. I lived in Costa Rica. It's beautiful, but you have to have U.S. income to be able to live there. And so Colombia is very different, as are many other countries nearby, where we can invite people to learn from and bring resources in a, a mutually respectful way. And so I see the replacement for extractive tourism mostly being a story of regenerative education. But part of that regenerative education is models of regenerative economy, agroforestry, agroecology, local material flows for textiles and plant medicine and construction materials, all the things that are the basis of uh, bioregional economy. And so I know that we're at time, but I hope that that starts to answer the question. And, um, and it also starts to show that there is a healthy decolonizing relationship between the wealthier North and the so-called less wealthy South. Colombia is not poor. Colombia has some of the richest biodiversity on earth, has some of the richest cultural diversity on earth. And if we recognize that, then there's a mutual exchange of wealth between money from the North, connections from the North and the incredible wealth of knowledge, ecology and culture that's in the so-called Global South. I don't like the framing of Global South, but I hope that that makes sense. So we're now like one minute over time, which means unfortunately, we're gonna have to come to a close. But um, I hope that today in this session, you got a feel for both how we're approaching bioregions in two contexts, the greater Toronto and here in Bodhichara, Colombia, and how we're benefiting from mutual exchange that could be imitated in many other landscapes around the world. And many, many more of us are doing this work now. And so I hope um, I hope this has been inspiring and informative. And thank you so much for joining us for this session. Mm -hmm.